welcome back. My name is Sean and today we are finally getting back into Malazan with book 5, Midnight Tides. So if you couldn't tell from the kind of tongue-in-cheek intro, it is a bit of a nut kick getting five books into a series and suddenly not knowing who any of the characters are, how the magic system works, not that I knew how it worked before because they never explained it. And just being on a whole new continent with new stakes and while there were a few overlapping characters it was very weird and off-putting just to suddenly appear in a completely different story thousands and thousands of pages into a series. Where am I right now? Lecter! Well, let's call an ambulance. I don't need any You help. got a pretty bad gash there, buddy. I feel like shh, You got a out concussion. Uh, Red Midnight Tides. Why did you do that? I thought it was cool. I eventually got one over and my thoughts on this book were actually pretty positive but when I think about Malazan and just my earlier views on it and how just so many people DNF this, it's very apparent there are so many different spots where you think that you're good and then suddenly you're just thrown into a completely new mess. Question for you. What are those? And to me after I was able to get back into the book and started to really enjoy it again, I there is a very weird sense where Steven Erickson is a master at just building up anticipation because one of the things that I noticed that he does very well is at the end of each book you generally have some convergence or another where all these wide different plot strings suddenly come together and it's just this massive glorious thing. And now we have a whole new separate series that's happening within like the main series, you know, the different kind of sub books, sub arcs, different timelines and continent that you know that eventually everything's just going to smash together and it's going to be this really crazy, really like cool thing. So I was pretty positive on this book, but it was an immediate thing and it took me about like 10 or 11 chapters in order for me to even get my feet underneath me and start enjoying it but there's a lot to talk about here so let's go ahead and start like diving into it but to give you guys a bit of a warning this is going to be probably one of my longest videos to date i'm gonna try to make up for it with a lot of editing later on in post what year is it it's gonna be a long one so i'm going to try to outline it out so if there's anything in particular that you want to see feel free to just click around or you know put it on for background noise and watch it five times to help with the youtube algorithm i won't complain But one thing I have noticed is that there is so much to cover here and when I was kind of doing some extra research to make sure I wasn't going to forget everything and checking out what other people thought about this series, I was confronted with the fact that I couldn't find like a clear concise consensus on this book. In fact, I would see regular people kind of meeting in like groups of four or five and you know just pure Malazan booktubers who are like heavily focused more on that. They were taking like two to five hours to digest this. I saw people going chapter by chapter with like Stephen Aaron. Erickson, there is a lot to cover here and I'm not going to be able to cover it all in this video. I have picked out some things that I think are the most interest to me and there are some things that I won't talk about in this video but I'm making notes for my eventual giant Malazan wrap up video that I do want to talk about like certain themes and certain like giant plot threads that are going through everything. But to give you guys a bit of a roadmap, I want to start out with my general thoughts and impressions. Kind of contrast like while I enjoyed probably House of Chains more than this book that had to do with kind of the momentum going into this book but I think Midnight Tides by itself I probably think is a better book in general like if I had to do a standalone one by one. I think Midnight Tides is pretty strong, but I think I enjoyed House of Chains more just given the fact that it took three books to get that momentum ramp up and you have that sort of carrying through in it. So I do want to talk about how like Malazan kind of does that and how once you start getting that momentum going, it becomes very cool versus when you start everything like kind of fresh and new, it's interesting and there's some stuff I want to dive into about that. But then I want to talk a little bit about the themes of this book. I won't go into everything because there are a lot of different themes kind of going through this and I don't want to retread territory that I've seen other people do. Just kind of give some of my own thoughts about it and sort of talk about Malazan as a whole. And finally, I wanted to dive into some characters. Now, I won't do every character. I'm going to try to touch on all the major ones and kind of group them together, but sort of certain plot events, what I thought about the character, why I like them or why I don't like them, and just sort of diving into more and more about the world and just generally like what was my reception is for certain characters. One kind of a sneak peek into that is like I wasn't very impressed with Troll in the last book. 
House of Chains. He didn't have a lot of context, you know, he seemed a bit of a pacifist and a giant war of just epic titans clashing against each other. So seeing him be more of a warrior in this book and kind of seeing his backstory was super fun and interesting and kind of changed my mind about that character. And if you haven't guessed, we are five books into the series, so there will be heavy spoilers for everything. I don't think anyone in their right mind would go into a review of book five of Malzahn and not expect to get spoiled. I mean, Maybe they're out there, I see people still doing spoiler free reviews, but this far into the series with this much other people who have covered this series, it seems like kind of a fruitless endeavor and I don't want to go down that path. And lastly, I will have my traditional ramble kind of wrapping everything up, picking up whatever thoughts I didn't quite get to, and just trying to tie everything together in my own kind of convergence. So getting into my general thoughts, and this is like my third or fourth take trying to record this, something I don't normally do, but there are so many weird directions for this video to go to because Midnight Tides is so massive. Gonna try it again with a little less rambly. I rather enjoyed this book. Yes, it took 10 chapters, 11 chapters for me to get sunk back into the world and figure out what the hell was happening. And that is something I view as pretty negative as House of Chains. I did not have that issue. And because of that, I think House of Chains still to this date is my favorite Malazan book. Even though I think Midnight Tides is a better written book. And just if you take them on their own, then I think Midnight Tides is much superior but losing that momentum and having to start fresh while I think that's going to lead to some amazing things down the line and probably the biggest convergence to date that's going to be the most epic thing and it's just gonna blow my mind and I'm gonna like finally be like Malazan all the way, make a top 10 list of my favorite fantasy series just so I can put Malazan on there. It did have the drawbacks that, you know, I, now being in a completely new place, new world, having to figure things back out. Five books into the series, it's, it seems like that's a very bold choice to do. I'm not saying it's the wrong choice because I haven't finished the series and once I see how everything's laid out, I'll be able to make more informed judgments. But not having wrapped up the stuff before and just starting a whole new section in there is just very interesting. Like you have the Stormlight Archives that are doing the 10 book series. You had it like linearly chronological where you had the first five books and then you're going to have a whole new arc, a new era section that's gonna tie everything back in there. That just makes more sense to me. This whole jumping back and forth between timelines, which for Malazan is nothing new, I think is disorienting. And I think a big reason why a lot of people didn't have this series. And I don't know if I would have even gotten this far if I wasn't doing this for book dude and just Hearing so many people say, just go on, finish it, get to these books before you make up your mind. There's a lot of rewards and like stuff to dig up and very cool things that happen in Malazan. Fuck. That's a laser raptor. But it's becoming more and more of a struggle to get to those. I think past this point, we're good because these are the only two major sort of sub arcs, like one and two, and like you're gonna see them intertwine. At least I'm hoping that's the case. I applaud the risk taken and to be able to do that, you know, it takes some massive balls. So I'm really hoping everything pays off and just based off how many people like love this series, I'm pretty sure it does. But there were a lot of cool plot threads going through this book. Some not so much for me. If you were to ask me some more about like Saren's plot, I have a couple bits and pieces, but for me, like her stuff really didn't like stick in my mind except when she started getting with like iron bars so I couldn't really tell you a lot about what her stuff was she seemed more relegated to the expedition and figuring out what happened to the world I really enjoyed Tahol and Bug and that whole just having that type of character who's not like the big great sword wheeling monster like Karsa but instead someone smart who's playing with the economy and politics and just seeing how those rippled out i thought that was extremely well done i was quite invested in like shirk and kettle and just sort of exploring that realm of like zeth and the house of the dead and just super cool to get into and of course getting into like the crippled god and his effect on the tist adder and like seeing what the sengar brothers were up to it was just there was a lot that happened in here i'll try to get more focused in on their plot details in my character section of this video but all in all just there was more to like than i think to dislike in this book I like what Erickson does when he asks the reader to think about certain questions. One theme that we had a lot in the previous books had to do with like more relativism and I think that happens more in this book as well. Maybe not as extreme comparing like Karsa to some of the more extreme desert people that were just straight up like child mutilationists but... <laughs> 
getting into like the lather and seeing them just battle out against the test adder and hearing about like the Silchus and like you know his battle against Scavendire Blood Eye is just very cool to see sort of some of these ancient plot threads that were back then and how they weaved into today and just how certain cultures rely to themselves or just rewrite their history to better suit like their sort of psyche and like what they think of themselves. It's definitely something if you were a fan of history that is rampant throughout there where the victors write history and they will write it in such a way that they look good so going back and just kind of seeing like these sort of threads being pulled out in this book I thought was very well done and enjoyable. Getting halfway through and realizing that it's not really halfway, I am very excited about the upcoming books. Getting further into where we're seeing this conflict actually start to take off, the main kind of takeaway I took away from this book is that because this happened before Perrin and the Deck of Dragons and him becoming master of the deck, we were seeing all this happen through a probably the weakest form of the crippled god we have seen yet and you know he had that big decision to make in memories of ice where he would invite him back into the deck and retake over the house of chains now he has to play by the rules but you know when he wasn't playing by the rules he was very much limited in his power and just seeing the kind of chaos he can do when he's like maybe not playing the rules but just limited what's going to happen in the future books he has like car says now to chains he started to get his like pantheon of people in his deck and now that he's like fully back in the game with full power, you know, we just have this like giant machination just from multiple different books, seeing him coming at it from multiple angles. So, you know, what's the big plan? And I'm very excited because I've heard book seven is like when everything like really converges up there. And the fact there's probably three books of Fallout is just something I can very much look forward to. First 10 chapters for me for rough, but then after that, I was fully on board and seeing what's being built here is extremely cool. <laughs> you know, there's something to be said about epic fantasy and just how epic it can be actually made. I think at this point and seeing this pulled off, Malazan will definitely take the cake for the most expansive fantasy that I have read so far. I've never Ever seen this many plot threads just kind of pulled together and just like thrown at each other. Certain fantasies that I like will have like a bunch of different factions running into each other but generally through the lens of a singular character. No 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 here's like 15 antagonists that are all trying to compete against each other and don't forget about the antagonist from a thousand years ago. We got some dinosaurs that are smart with like laser beams and sword for hands. They're still pushing the plot too and we're going to see what this giant mess is. It's like when you start going into like or documentaries where it's like you think someone has a plan here but you're just having reactions against reactions against reactions and you know if you get into the trench warfare world war one it's like hey we were at war for years this many people died and no one gained more than the foot conflict during this whole time but don't worry we killed everybody in the meantime i'm getting into some of the themes of this book they're is something that I need to go back on a reread or re-look into whenever I start doing the full-on like wrap-up. It seems like there are these continuing like themes of familiar relations where I'm not sure what the first three books would be but I feel like there's something there but for sure House of Chains was very sisterly bonds where we're telling the story between Felicent and her sister Tavore and sort of that bond of sisterhood and sort of the consequences of like when that family bond goes completely awry and it was a very sad tragic story. In this book you're very much telling the themes and stories of brotherhood. Not only do you have the Tist Adder brothers that have their own familiar conflict that causes Roulette to just go completely off his rocker and sort of just the complications between like troll and fear that I'll get into a bit later. You also have the weird complications of Tahol Bryce and his brother Hole. And just seeing how all these interplays go back and forth with each other, it seems like there have been a lot of sort of themes just kind of nestled into Malazan on top of everything else. I don't have a lot of extra thoughts on this. It's just something I wanted to note that digging into it and sort of thinking about this like, huh, the last book was kind of revolving around sisters since I get there's brothers. So I'm curious if that's going to be a continued theme or trend going towards that, if each book will hold like a certain relation for that. And if that's the case, then how wild is that going to get? get into the whole verisimilitude of cousins and in-laws? I don't know. That's 
<laughs> probably not gonna happen but it's always cool just seeing that not only do you have the themes of like kindness and grim darkness that are happening in Malazan but in each different book there seems to be more exploration of certain things the last book I think was very heavily kind of asking you the reader questions about moral relativism and what's okay and what's wrong and if there are such things as universal good or bad especially because morals can evolve independently of each other what someone might view as rude or uncouth in another culture would be completely fine so these i think are very effective questions to ask the reader and things i enjoy seeing nested in these books this book too i think also played a lot with the ideas of revisionist histories conquest and capitalism and what i thought was very cool was while you do look negatively upon the test editor because roulette's being controlled by the crippled god and they are doing horrific things with magic that are very reminiscent of like nuclear bombs and hiroshima and sort of the sheer toll of death of just that type of conquest you also see that leather's not perfect and has a lot of issues and you know capitalism's not the best system while there doesn't seem to be any other better options it still is kind of diving into that and sort of exploring it i don't have my full thoughts completed on like the actual themes or like what I feel about this yet because so much happens in this book that I feel like I have to just sit there to even unwrap the plot in my head so things that I will want to dive into later on once I have like a full on like understanding of the series and what it's trying to say but things that I also noted that were pretty interesting to have also added into these books the amount of stuff that gets crammed in here from anthropology to moral relativism to just all the different sort of themes and human kind of conditions it's very interesting to see just how skillful everything was just like nested in there and it's fun to explore and unpack okay so we'll finally start diving into some plot points by talking about the different characters and i'm going to try to organize this into a way that makes sense but i will absolutely be missing some characters so if I missed one of your favorite characters, sorry, I'm trying to narrow this down to keep this video underneath an hour. I wanted to start with the Lethary side and talk about Tehel and Bug and dive into some stuff with his brothers. I think Tehel and Bug were probably my favorite part of this series. I really enjoyed the back and forth comedy of them. Tehel as a character not being this like great warrior, instead being the kind of like very smart economic mastermind that is just trying to keep everything kind of fresh and accidentally overthrew the economy multiple times and planned to do it again i just really enjoyed that concept as a character so much through this series we've seen just these like hulking like barbarians of characters or these mysterious like super cool guys and just seeing like a guy who's just smart that is able to bring an entire empire to a close just by using principles of economics and just kind of just wit and everything just absolutely loved it his relationship with bug too they were a fun pair to unravel because you know tell by most outward appearances would be like the one in charge but the further and further we got down the series like as he is working with bug to help shand and like overthrow the economy again to just make them all filthy rich you know little tiny things start like coming out about like bug things start start adding up First of all, Bug, every time he cooks, seems to have something completely inedible and does not make any sense, and yet, like, Tehul's been, like, living off this for years, so clue one, something's not right when they're eating straight-up shoes or just, like, weird insects and <laughs> completely fine and sustained, then that's, like, huh, or something's weird a bit happening. I have a big fucking problem. Yes, I do! Man! Fuck me. This is wrong! Oh, my Fuck God. Me. This is wrong! It's just wrong! Get three more going. Get three, right, more, three, going. More, three more going. Later on, as we're going through the series, Bug just continues to have more and more insight into like weird things, especially when he starts coming into contact with the undead and like Kettle and Shirk and certain histories that a normal character would have no means of like really knowing. It's was cool to see that slow mystery and like you knew something was up with Bug as we keep going through. Once he starts like seeing certain characters or seeing like, you know, monsters flee from him and some of the physical feats that he's able to perform that by the time that you find out that he's an ascended god, you're not that surprised. But when you find out that he's an elder god in one of the originals, you're like, holy shit, this is pretty unexpected and it was like kind of cool to see i like that theme of just him having lived so long and got so bored that 
through just the really human and kind of craziness of Taho, he was able to find enjoyment in life again. And interesting, like when you have like kind of a buddy cop comedy like that, and one of the buddy cops just so happens to be, you know, a actual living god. <laughs> but Taho, definitely my favorite character of this book. Watching his reactions to like Shirk and Kettle, just sort of how he builds things up, how he takes everything in, and sort of just those different machinations that he made, I thought were really fun to get through. And when the war actually came to Lethu's door, step and the test editor were coming in just having him just pretty much killed and having like revived i thought was interesting and the most interesting thing that i'm very curious about what's going to happen is when the guardian names came and decided that like oh well this is the previous guardian's name's brother let's give him the name of all these forgotten gods and the fact that all of these were under male slash bugs like purview I'm really curious to see what's going to happen to that and that's something that has happened a few times in the series where you have like a character that I like or that's likable that seems like pretty average if not like a good swordsman or smart or something but very much not like an ascended god when you have them get elevated in some weird way I like seeing how like they interplay then with the rest of the world. I think Parent's one of the most like blatant examples of this and of course there are many others the bridge burners well good warriors there's something weird happening with that ascended song with them so very cool to see with that. His relationship with his brother so I think are like what really stood out to me other than just his like pure machinations having Bryce being this like legendary warrior that's just not super bright and sort of them having to rehash their different like childhoods and just how they took it in completely different ways especially with his other brother Hole that you know seemingly betrayed everybody it was cool seeing those brotherly bonds kind of take on there while yes they're in very different places Bryce coming back in and trying to warn Tahel of certain things even though Tahel is probably like the smartest character that we have met to date it was all just fun to dive into I really enjoyed Bryce too he wasn't my favorite character in this series but seeing him taking on the different like moral responsibilities you know his whole scene with the guardian of the names and just how like through his own kindness he gave his strength to the guardian just he was a very upstanding character that i enjoyed a bit showing very obviously concern for his brother but like also a very strong sense of duty his final scene with like Rulad where even with the cripple god powering him he was just able to figure out the entire plot and just like hey you have to die to get power again and that will like reheal you but if i just like expertly sword skill you and just make sure that you can't really move or do anything and are just pretty much like useless but won't actually die yeah this is big brain time big brain move it was just super epic moment but then to have him just immediately die afterwards if it was a bit of a letdown but i'm hoping because this is something that i'm also noticing is that when characters die in malazan they never really truly die something to do with like the whole ascent and stuff so i'm hoping because he had that contact in with like the gardens of names and his brother being tehol and also like leather not having like a, a house of death so you just have all these weird spirits and the dead running around it'd be cool to see him come back and just be like some kind of undead warrior don't know what's happening yet but I always like to enjoy like characters being reborn into different things, so hopefully we see Bryce again. Pole, I don't have a lot to say. He was one of those characters that just I kind of like glazed over going through in the midst of everything else. But his ending scene, I just thought was like very tragic. Him having betrayed the Lether and the, his family, and then having to go back to explain to Tahul exactly why that wasn't the case, and trying to like rationalize for himself. The fact that he would even risk during the middle of an invasion to go and try to do this only to like get stabbed to death by just a bunch of generic youths I thought was overall kind of just a sad thing to see. And diving a little bit back into Bug or also known as the Elder God Male, the whole idea of just abandoning responsibility and getting bored of immortality with him especially being an Elder God is something I always enjoy seeing. It's like the bored immortal that just has experienced so much and just so many different things that have happened to him that they lose their lust for that. That you hear in some of the other books that ascendancy is kind of a curse more than a blessing and the plots of and you know the plot of like 
Hood and Cotillion was to just completely try to take on that burden to make humanity not have to suffer that anymore. I always love that trope, bored god trying to find new meaning in humanity or whatever interactions and just abandoning all the responsibilities in the meantime. Having him being the butler of Tehol was really fun and I'm very excited to see what's going to happen with him later. Now still in the Lethu side, I wanted to talk about Shirk, Kettle, and Silk Chess Ruin. The whole Shirk and Kettle arc I thought was pretty enjoyable, very high up on like the things I was most excited for to see pop up. The idea that you're presented with this mystery early on where it's like, hey, I just got murdered, but now I'm just walking around like alive, like what's happening? His daddy can't talk. Look who knows so much, huh? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. Why are there so many people in this canal that I woke up from? And then also having a little murder girl that just kind of goes wrong, that's trying to feed this like cower that keeps demanding sacrifice and stuff. It was just this big mystery that was happening during it and I thought was very interesting. Shirk, her whole arc of trying to become human again and her being a renowned thief in the previous life. I've mentioned before, I am a sucker for heists and thieves and fantasy. I think that is very under neglected. So having an element of that in this book was pretty fun. But watching her having to like get reborn in a certain way or having her body sort of stuffed full of flowers, having some sort of <laughs> vagina fish put inside of her that needs constant feeding. Once again, Erickson is choosing the more interesting choices when you think back to him and his like a Jane Jamel and Velociraptor dinosaurs with lasers and psychic powers. You shouldn't be surprised at this point. But when I went on the wiki page to see what an Ululu looked like, and it was just like, yep, that's it. <laughs> but I enjoyed her as a character. Her meeting with one of Tahoe's bodyguards I thought was hilarious because he was like love struck with the Shan sisters and like he just wanted to have someone to cuddle with him and like be in a happy relationship with him and they just wanted him for his giant piece because he was part death and all. Having like her just being morose about being undead and sad and then having him just like unwilling to get up because he's just so sad that only the women just want to sleep with him and nothing else. <laughs> My emotions! My emotions! It was a fun little moment of humor in these and also I'm noticing with like Erickson writing these books that his humor is getting more prevalent through it. In the first few books you had little scenes in here that everyone could point to but you're seeing it more interspersed in some of these characters and it's something I very much enjoy but watching her unraveling the mystery of like Eberich and just how far he's like really pushed his king's peace and everything it was just very fun to see and the relationship with Kettle I thought was a very interesting one so Kettle is another one of those unfortunate undead that just sort of came out of nowhere and you don't know if she's been murdered or not diving more into her story she was one of the more interesting characters she starts like interacting with Silk Chess Ruin and inside of the Aza house and you know something is kind of afoot. You later find out she has a very definite connection with the Fork Group Assail and among some other things. So while she was dead in the beginning, she starts to become very much undead and that Fork Rule Assail blood or whatever was happening with that definitely has given her an edge and certain sort of powers, but just having her interaction between Shirk looking for a mother and thinking like Tattles her father and then also getting along with Soul Chess Ruin, just one of the more interesting characters I read about. Whenever you have alien, undead, murder child kind of running around doing things, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna get pretty invested. And Silk Chess Ruin too. I talked about earlier how you have that like, through revisionist history, but having a brother to Animander Rake and sort of diving into some of like the Malazan history, hearing about the true tale of like him and Scavendora Blood Eye, about like how messed up and just fearsome the Kachane Jamel were before they had a 200,000 Kistandi soldiers went in to go fight just 60,000 Kachane Jamel hunters and they were decimated to a thousand only then to get betrayed and locked into the Azath house. It was just all very interesting and him as a character so far I really enjoyed. Maybe it's a relationship between Animander and Rick, but they seem to have just like the most sort of like cool, calm, collected characters and just between their dialogue and how like they take everything in stoically, I think that on the cool scale they are very high up and I'm excited to see his future adventure with like Kettle and Shirk and everyone and the fact that they all just jumped on a boat together just to go off to adventure in Malazan land. I would say the Lethry arcs or all of the arcs that were in Lethry that I just mentioned were probably my favorite going through this series. I did enjoy Troll's arc and some of the Tistatter, but if you're going between fantasy heists and like undead and just sort of like this rampant like ill consequences of capitalism and everything, I think personally 
that was more enjoyable while all of the sad, dark, messed up things in Four Perfect Ripple of God and Conquest were on the test adder side and while I did enjoy them, the last three I think were the more fun side to be on. Getting into the test adder side of things, I want to start out with the Sengar brothers and some of the characters that come into contact with them. I mentioned earlier on that like Troll, I wasn't a huge fan of him in House of Chains mainly because we didn't have much context and just throwing him in together with another Tist Andy after the book three had like a very prominent Tist Andy as well. It didn't feel like a lot was being added with his character. You hear some about his like betrayal and you don't really get exposed a lot to who the Tist Adder were or anything that was happening with him. Just you know that he betrayed someone and like his brother was kind of a piece of shit. Going further down into like House of Chains, you know, you just see him constantly avoiding conflict and just kind of taking more of a pacifistic route. And while he had a very clear level head and like that book with all the chaos and violence and conquest that was happening, it just for him, he seemed to be a low point of the book for me. This book, however, you start diving into his character and start like really figuring out who he is as a person. You don't have like the after effects of everything that made him what he was after. So instead seeing that like kind of transition and knowing the end that House of Chains troll was gonna happen somewhere, I thought was a very interesting piece to read through. Having him being like the skeptic and like probably like the better brother to everybody, I thought was interesting. Hassan Mossag, the warlock king, sent him off to go retrieve some weird item from the far off icy waste. Have Having him fight off the Jack, having him having to deal with like the immaturity of his brother Rulad and started like getting with the sheer rigidity of like fear, I thought was all very interesting. Probably one of my favorite parts of this book was just how he took in like the whole transformation of Rulad and just being thrown full into a conquest that he obviously wants no part of. As we keep going through this book and as like they're thrown further and further into a war by Rulad, you know, multiple times it comes up where people don't like the fact that he's actually voicing skepticism, where he's one of the only ones where it's like, hey, maybe we shouldn't invade and destroy and just blow up all these different leathery villages. Like this seems excessive, maybe we shouldn't do that. And people think him a coward for doing so. But every time that someone starts to accuse him of that or when things finally get so far, you find out that Troll is just an expert warrior and just well put together guy. He's not voicing these criticisms or skepticism because he's afraid of it, much to the contrary. He's probably one of the more capable warriors that we found in this book. Instead, it's just a matter of just him like not liking what's happening and having the courage to actually voice it out of there. One of my favorite scenes, I think, of him in this book was when he had to force a heal to come and heal that demon that he befriended just to have that demon go around and kind of convince them that like, oh, they have to kill me to do this. I just want to be let free. You could bond me and I could like let you go. And like, you know, it's a trick. He lets them go. He, the demon's like released from servitude. And then like, you know, he finds out that that was just some elaborate trick by the demon. Like, ah, uh, <laughs> that's a good one, man. Enjoy your freedom. I thought that was a very cool moment and just kind of really indicative of who Troll is as a character. Rulad, on the other hand, there is definitely something to be said about like the inferiority complex of there. I'm not a youngest brother. I have a younger brother, so hopefully he doesn't feel this way in relation to like his siblings, but constantly trying to get the respect of his older two, trying to fit in, trying to do things to make him seem more mature. Rulad had a lot of baggage going into here. And with the Tist or a society where you're not even considered like a man or even like a full on like person to be around until you kill something that definitely adds some added tension into the whole scene when he winds up getting killed by the jack holding on to a sword and gets brought back you know, one of the first things that his mother was worried about was like did he kill anybody is he blooded it's like you know your son's dead maybe don't worry about like if he killed anyone but in order for them to even get the proper bureau rights or be considered participant in society you having to do that i think that does put a lot of pressure especially on the younger persons i'm there because it's something they have to cross in order to be taken remotely seriously having him die and giving that ultimatum by the crippled god where it's i can give you power every time you die you get more power but we're gonna have to use this for conquest i gave han and masek power and he betrayed me did not go into the bloodbath I wanted him to get into, but you will have to commit to that. If you're cool with it, let's start dying immediately. He comes back just like this waxy monster that just had like multiple coins put onto him, just kind of burned into his flesh. And every time he dies, he goes a little bit crazier, gets more powerful, and this whole time he's this revolting coin wax monster. It was interesting seeing his character 
because in the beginning he's just all full of power and just was so ready to take his place at the table that I don't think he really fully understood what he was getting into. You see him immediately take Maya in to be his like new like emperor queen and that's its own kind of horror horrific shit show. But later on as he starts like befriending Udinas and goes on and the further and further he gets into command and people taking him constantly seriously, you realize like kind of what of an immature dick he's been. And there is like a positive character growth that's going in here. Now that's kind of like a false character arc because the more times he dies, the more insane he gets. And by the end of this book, he is very, very, very insane. But having him becoming basically a force of nature for the crippled god and dragging along his brothers, it was cool seeing the differences between trolls and fear's kind of reactions. Fear, through this book, I don't have as much to say about him but he seemed to try to uphold what was considered the gold standards of his race. The duty, not questioning, being like a war leader, being able to like be effective in combat. He was constantly getting on to troll for like voicing his doubts and like being that person that was taking the attention away from like, hey, why are we doing this? This isn't right. Our emperor is a corn goblin and very much insane. So uh, maybe, maybe don't. <laughs> And by the end of like his arc in this book, you see that like, oh, I see Troll was actually the brave one. I was going to, I kept calling him a coward and just really criticizing him. But he was the one to actually have the courage to stand on all along. Just you're seeing like this very intricate bonds between brothers and how that like affects everything and watching each of these different characters grow in their own ways and setting up the stage for what's going to happen later on in the series was very exciting. You have a much more powerful Rulad that's just even more insane. Just raring to go with a full-on army on his back and just very insane sorceries that are basically nuclear bombs in his back pocket. We know Troll gets shorn and thrown out there and just kind of does wand with his own thing, so I'm wondering how that's going to retie back into the main story. And then Fear, too, decides that, like, oh, hey, well, Hanan Mossag got his power from the crippled god because, hey, by, by the way, Father Shadow, he's uh, kind of dead, so we should go find him. So I'm excited to see where those go and just see how all this will eventually culminate and wrap up. And lastly, cause my, I have been talking for like an hour now. <laughs> Let's go ahead and dive into some of the Ascended and some of the side characters I think are very much worth mentioning. Like Udinas, Withal, and diving into the Crippled God. Udinas was definitely up there for one of my favorite character arcs through this series. Using him to explore what the actual Lethary society is in the negative form, you know, having him be like a slave to the Tist Eder, seeing like the very negative sides of the capitalistic society I thought was very interesting. The whole notions of being indebted and being enslaved and how you can be a slave, but if you're not indebted, you're somehow better off because you don't owe someone money insanity and watching his sort of like back and forth with like feather witch and his infection and just sort of the different intricate plans that were happening with him i thought was very interesting having him take in a with all that was like a race trying to tell him like hey we need to get as close to this like crazy roulette as possible we need to be in a position of power and for him to actually become like in one of the more influential people in test society was a very crazy ride to see some of the other things that, you know, I think that Steven Erickson does a lot of and something that may be a criticism of this book was that he puts in a lot of YouTube demonetization word into his books. And this is something that happened with Udinas, where he just had some random goddess come up and just swoop in and steal that seed and having him have an ascended child just somewhere off in some dream world that I'm sure is going to come into play later. It's just... In this book especially, it seemed like every other character just had that misfortune come upon them. I think when you overuse any tool, it sort of loses meaning. Complete side tangent digression. Udinas with his like rise to power and like the idea that he was a very humanizing factor on Rulad, I thought was pretty fun to watch. You know, Rulad is going insane. He got everything he wanted and more at a very steep price and really just wants to be treated human and with respect and having Udinas an indebted slave being the only one that just doesn't care enough or like cares enough to just be like, hey, I'll talk to you, I'll be your friend and just not view him as some like waxy coin monster, I think was like kind of a cool plot. Rulad through the influence of Udinas towards the middle of there was starting to become a decent person. He was starting to make better decisions. He was regretting his actions. And I think a lot of that was just having someone who was willing to hear him out and not judge him. 
Eventually he disappears because that Wyval that was inside of him decided that it needed to do other things like rescue still chess ruin. Udinas instead of doing what he was meant to do, instead just through no fault of his own just winds up getting declared like a giant betrayer. But just his whole background with Alether having Bryce clear his indebtedness and having him still like remain at Roulette's side was a very interesting character and I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with him. His interactions with Rather Witch 2, building out the world building of this and being like a very good conduit for getting deeper into Tistad or society, it was just, I think he was a very cool character and very cool tool to learn from. With all, he was kind of a small character in this book but very interesting and the Cripple God's Island wherever he is in this like little tent, he has like recruited a master bladesmith and promised him freedom after doing certain things but kept messing with his mind, messing with his mind, and some of his interactions with some of the denizens of that island I thought were pretty interesting and fun. But the main thing that I really enjoyed was him finally having that breaking point and then just running off to like mess up the uh, Cripple God's tent. We have this terrible like crippled creature, then the main antagonist for the series and just having some angry blacksmith just like mess his tent up and then have Mail come in there and just like beat the shit out of him. It was just very unexpected and kind of fun to go through. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna see a lot more of his character, but just that little scene at the end there and just kind of giving more insight into the Crippled God, I thought was just a lot of fun. And lastly, the Crippled God. It's always interesting when you give certain like antagonists or bad guys like a lot of power. It's like whenever you have like a devil king or demon king and you're trying to actually put motivations behind it and make it where it's not going to become something ridiculous, I think that's actually very hard to do. When you have like a big bad guy and you're trying to step into his head, I think it can get goofy a lot of times. So maintaining that balance of just kind of being the scary serious thing but then like also having it be like relatable where you can kind of understand its motivation, it's a very fine tread to walk. And up until this point, we have had a few interactions with the crippled god where I think they did a great job showcasing sort of like how messed up he is and how evil he is. You know, even his like remnants of his body when they were destroyed from you know, the uh, earth became these like powerful dead creatures and stuff, like very mysterious. And there's a lot of like cool bad guy stuff happened along with him. In this book, however, I felt like a bit let down on the interactions we had with him. His interaction with Rulad and sort of trying to tempt him with power, I thought was well done. But for the most part, you just have like a crippled guy sitting in a tent that eventually gets flipped over and beat up. So having like, yes, it's been done by an elder god, it was just very interesting. And compared to like how we've ex been exposed to him in the beginning of the series and just you know, his like need to cripple people, having to inflict his own chaos into the world to free everything, I thought were all like great motivations. But in the book that had the most of him so far in the series, I just felt like a little bit let down by his character. I feel like there could have been more with him. But knowing the context that now he's going in to get more power and this is from him at a limited sort, you know, you're seeing kind of that trickster devil playing those like little seeds and why he was such a pain in the ass to deal with before. Now, without the use of his like house, he's able to like, get still chess's ruined swords, fuse them together, and then just like create an empire of people that are going to go on conquest for him. Like absolutely terrifying as a villain. Going from that to like, oh no, my tent's broken, I'm gonna get beat up. It's just a little bit jarring. But overall, he's a very exciting like antagonist, and I think the main antagonist of the series. It's safe to say at this point. I'm very curious to see how his plans are gonna stack about against everyone else's because, like I mentioned earlier on in the video, just so many different like things are happening at the same time and it seems like less than just like a solid like I want to make this plot happen A to B it's like let's make these six things happen and see how they ripple off each other and it feels like Erickson was probably exploring this while he was writing it rather than just having it all just planned out and it's just a series of chain reactions that have led to some very epic moments I'm at like an hour of video so far <laughs> This is going to be amazing to edit. Overall though, I really enjoyed this. I am very excited to see how some of these characters are going to weave back into the main story. And with one with so many characters that I really enjoy, I'm curious to see how some of these characters will actually integrate. We didn't see a lot with Troll and House of Chains, but what's going to happen with like Tehol, what's going to happen with like Fear and Silchaz Ruin and all these guys searching for Father Shadow, especially with that whole back and forth of getting betrayed by him. I mean, there are so many different ways for this to go. 
and I have heard that we're not actually halfway through the series despite being book five, we're like 40% of the way. So we haven't even gotten to that halfway point and we're still building and building to some epic sort of convergence. Malazan has been very interesting for me to pick up and read and has definitely influenced how I think about like outlining worlds and how to like really create like an epic fantasy stories. I've always been a fan of the genre, but I've never seen it done this way specifically. I mean, you have certain things like Game of Thrones that like try to be very big with the political intrigue, but combining that with like epic magic, with like epic battles, and just seeing just the sheer expansiveness of this, I mean, definitely something special. And I think when I finish this, if it doesn't go completely off the rails, so probably be one of my favorite series just for the effort. But I still feel like we're in that territory where once I get through the second reread, then I will probably completely adored the series. This first one, just having to struggle to figure out things and having times where we do disappear to a new continent with new rules, new magics, new holds, all these things that we didn't have before. It's just, it can be overwhelming. So when people DNF this, I, <laughs> I don't blame them. But sticking through it this long so far has been pretty rewarding. And when you get sucked into it, it gets pretty cool. If you guys stuck around for the whole thing, <laughs> Thanks, that was a lot of effort, and you are definitely Malazan fans, because if you can stick through this for like an hour, then tearing through whatever hundred thousand of pages of Malazan, then makes a lot of sense. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this, if you had any favorite characters that I did not mention or anything that I missed, then some things I've deliberately left out. Feel free to comment down below and we can talk about it in the comments. There's so much to happen here and I'm already an hour in, so I'm gonna cut it off here. But as always, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And as always, take it easy.